Where does yesterday's future, which is already here, ready here, ready here, ready here, meet today's future, which is about to happen, and tomorrow's future, which could be just minutes away? Welcome to Technology Revolution, the future of now. Where host Bonnie D. Graham asks savvy futurists for their predictions about the tech-driven trends that are shaping our future right now. Here's your host, who will take us into the future of now, Bonnie D. Graham. Bonnie in the house. I love that intro. I still get a giggle out of it. That's my co And I'm looking at video of my panelists. We're all on Zoom today, and they're giggling too. That's the voice of Ryan Treasure, VP. I call him VP of everything at Voice America World Talk Radio, who recorded that wonderful intro for me. Let me tell you what our topic is today. This is important to every one of you around the world. We know we've heard of Industry 4.0. We've heard of maybe Industry 5.0. We know that things are changing in the workplace. We're not going to talk about COVID specifically. Specifically, we're going to talk today about jobs. So let me give you a couple of definitions and a couple of questions, and then I will ask my four esteemed panelists who are all over the world, which is really interesting. And no human's health was harmed in the making of this radio show. I have to tell you that we all are at a safe distance. So I have a quote from IndustryWeek.com, and let me read this. The factory of the future has an evolving definition, smart manufacturing, Industry 4.0, the digital enterprise. Here's the important part. Perhaps manufacturing at last will be able to leave behind the public impressions of labor-intensive, dirty, and dangerous work sites. There's only one characteristic of the factory of the future that is essential, a creative mindset for problem solving in and out of the box. And out of the box thinking is key to embracing new technologies. So we're talking today about jobs in the factory of the future. People might say, oh, I don't want my kids working in a factory. What are they going to do? And kids are saying, I don't want to go to technical or trade school to learn a factory job and be on a, an assembly line. That's boring or I'm never going to get anywhere. Well, everything has changed. So let me pose a couple of interesting questions and then we'll hear from my panelists. So what will future factory jobs look like? Will they only hire programmers? AI, artificial intelligence experts and supervisors? We're going to find out. Will we see thriving jobs only in the hubs of tech, Silicon Valley and perhaps MIT in Boston? Will we see jobs in the food industry? Not so sure with restaurants closing right now. Is there room and a role for the, and I'm putting this gently and politely, the not so educated, perhaps the job level where people are working in a fast food restaurant. They might be serving at a, at a drive up. They might be flipping a burger. They could be tossing a salad, but they are a not educated level. And, and we all know what that is. Will the future factory give everyone, this is an interesting question, a base Welfare level monthly allowance for life. Interesting. Uh Uh-huh. I don't know what political bent that would be. Will it reduce the work week to 35 or even 30 hours for all those of you who are working 40, 50, 60, 80, 100 hours? Wouldn't that be refreshing? And not to get political, but will the first truly smart factories be in Asia or Europe before the U.S. does? So I have Garrett Hoppe. I have Dr. Christian Litka, I have Rakesh Gandhi, and Nils Hertzberg. They're all here today, and we're going to ask for their take on jobs in the factory of the future. Who, what, where, when, how, and how much money. I'm Bonnie D. Graham. Welcome to to Technology Revolution, the Future of Now. Happy to have you here. Let's go around the table and meet my special guest, Garrett Hoppe. You're up first, and why don't you tell us a little about where you are, what you do, and what does this topic mean to you? Garrett, you're up. Uh, my name is Gerd Hopper. Hello. Um, thanks for having me on the show. Um, I'm working right now with a technology company. We are basically providing um, automation equipment to build machines, robots. So it looks in the first hand like this company, which is a mid-sized, agile, worldwide active company based in Germany, uh, present in uh, 40 countries, selling directly. Uh, so we directly sell no distribution directly to our customers, which are machine builders or manufacturers, uh, um, entities in the investment goods industries, as we call this. Um, we, we might be seen as somebody who would be replacing jobs, but actually we provide um, automation equipment in situations where human labor is uh, intense, dirty, as you mentioned, um, mm-hmm. and also where... Um, the labor is not really human. And um, so that's an interesting um, 
uh, um, topic to us in our daily work because we're challenged as to our role in the world. Um, we, we also work, so my role is to be an executive in this company. I work with customers, uh, global accounts, and do strategic uh, technology consulting with them. Um, I'm working now 26 years with this company, Beckhoff Automation, as it is called. We're also present in the U.S., in, in Minneapolis, where I actually uh, lived for five years and started this operation together with my family. So I have a certain um, leaning uh, towards the U.S. I have friends there, still uh, um, regularly travel, traveled, I have to say, past form because COVID stopped that uh, in, a, in an amazing amount and depth, and um, we're looking forward to recover and, and come back to that. What Thank is you, the first, what is, well, well, I want to know, what's, what's your take on this? Are you optimistic about jobs exactly. in the future in the future factory? What do you think? Yeah, is this good so, news? So I think future factories will still be uh, populated around um, centers of um, human population. So wherever you have uh, big conglomerations of people, you need food, you need the goods of the daily life. So that's where factories have to be located. Uh, and then uh, you would have both both types. So we, we see that the future technologies will both make it build a demand for uh, the AI um, uh, engineers, for the programmers, but at the same time, this gives an enormous uh, push uh, to employ low-level skilled workers because we can assist them with these AI tools and um, so the, the demand for even ever better and ever more perfect products is driven by the consumer. So if, if you and I, if we go to a shop and we would buy something which is made and you could see that people have touched the product in the making, like a handcrafted product, you would not buy it. You would just say, oh, it's used. Somebody touched it. So the jewel box of of a company in, in your um, Cupertino territory shows that uh, you want to have a pristine product in your hand. That's the demand of the customer. And, and so this drives inhumane jobs. And with the help of automation, with the help of um, artificial intelligence and industry 4.0 and the future factories, we avoid uh, and get people away from these inhumane jobs, either for low money, for low income, or for uh, fatiguing repetitive work or for hard work and 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 so we see the, the positive results and we can clearly say that we are not replacing work we are enabling work and we are responding to uh, what the, the, the regular consumer expects uh, from the ever progressing manufacturing work to provide a perfect product Thank you very much, Garrett Hoppe. Glad to have you on board, and thank you for your help with getting those interesting questions at the top of the show. I appreciate your input. Let's move around the table to Dr. Christian Litka at KUKA AG. Christian, there might be one person around the world who is not familiar with you because you've been on shows with me before. So for the benefit of that one human being and maybe one AI, tell us who you are, what you've been up to, and very briefly, what's your take on this topic? Go ahead, Christian. Hi, Bonnie. Thanks for having me. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I can't really believe this as someone in the world who doesn't know me. Um, yeah, like <laughs> I said, my name is Christian Nitke, and I'm currently sitting here in, in Augsburg, Germany, uh, because I'm working for, for KUKA, and, and KUKA is, is known as one of the largest robot manufacturers of the world, and uh, I myself have been an, an, an production um, executive all, all my life long, so I've, I've I'm a mechanical engineer by education, and uh, after that, I, I received my PhD in that topic, and I led production sites and uh, entire plants. So I, I pretty not much know what we are talking about in here, and uh, I think it's an interesting discussion because uh, although I'm only active uh, since 20 years uh, in the business, but uh, there are some evolvements that you see in, in, in production. And uh, sure, it's, it's still going on to, to evolve, but it's not going in this negative direction that everybody's always having fear of. So I'm, I'm happy to talk about this in, in the show. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, Christian. And I'm, I'm glad that we've enlightened that one human being who didn't know who you were. <laughs> Thank you. We've Great. got a newcomer to radio with me. I think he's been working in the background all this time with so many of you on other shows for me. And I'm delighted to welcome Rakesh Gandhi. Rakesh, please introduce yourself to everybody. Who are you? What do you do? And what does this topic mean to you? Welcome, Rakesh. 
Thanks, Bonnie. Thanks for having me on this show. Um, yes, I'm a newcomer after a long time, uh, but it's always been a pleasure to be on your show. Um, and uh, I'm sitting here in uh, uh, Philadelphia area near our headquarters uh, for North America. I work for SAP. And uh, I'm part of our uh, industry 4.0 digital transformation team um, and lead the North American customer engagement, work very, very closely with our customers to help them transform their uh, factory initiatives and uh, get into the path of digitization, leveraging all these new technologies. <laughs> Uh, I consider myself as an innovation enthusiast and also I would call it as an innovation gladiators, uh, gladiator as I have been involved in all these innovation technologies as they have evolved uh, over past one decade um, from the cloud, mobile, uh, you know, the internet of things, uh, AI, and uh, kind of converging this into helping our customers create that uh, smart factories. Firm believer uh, in, in, in the sense that uh, there are no accidents uh, when it comes to all this uh, technology evolution and how we leverage the technology. There's always some purpose um, that we are achieving, um, our innate needs, something that we haven't understood in the past, but kind of, you know, enduring towards that. Having said that, um, I Personally, from my career perspective, I've, I've, I've worked with uh, uh, the manufacturing companies, the automation companies in the past, and in the chemical companies as well, uh, and been always associated into helping uh, the companies that I've worked to go through that digital transformation right from 90s in different phases. And in my experience, uh, when it comes to the job, uh, it's an evolution, right? Um, mm -hmm. Change is constant. So... I'm very optimistic in terms of what's happening uh, in this field of smart factories uh, will take us in that direction as well. And uh, I predict that if anything, the jobs will increase, become more uh, digital as we go along. And looking forward to having the great conversation with the panel here. Thank you very much, Rakesh. I love the optimism. I appreciate that. You know, way before COVID, way before the global pandemic, there, there were theories. There were people around the world who were saying, OMG, oh my God, jobs are going away. We're all going to be replaced by robots. And on one show a couple months ago, I think I did a topic, are we ready for a robot CEO? And the answer was, Hell no, not yet. And the not yet was the key to the answer. So I'm actually looking at two of my panelists here on Zoom, and I can see that Nils Hertzberg is ready to introduce himself. Nils, there might be one person who doesn't know you, but everybody else does. So update us on what you've been up to and how optimistic are you on this topic. Welcome back, Nils. Bonnie, thanks for having me, and it's good to see you again. Um, yeah, my name is Nils uh, Hertzberg. I'm also working for SAP, but on the other side of the world. I'm sitting here in Germany as well. i uh, been associated with this whole topic of the manufacturing industries for the last 24 years now in SAP and before that as a business consultant as well. So um, I've seen the evolution of industry, and I've also seen – um, you know, how CEOs and leaders have always tried to drive efficiency, um, you know, from their companies, from their factories. And um, I think the discussion that we're talking, the topic that we're talking about right here, right now, is exactly, you know, the how is that going to evolve over the next 20, 30 years? You know, and are we going to have that robot CEO? Hell no, not now. But, um, you know, I'm not worried because that, see, that robot needs to be programmed and that's another job that we are going to create. <laughs> um, why is this so important to me? I think there's three um, reasons. First of all, it's fun. I think it is really fun to create value and if drive efficiency um, you know, in production. That's, I think, the one topic. The second topic is I have two sons um, sitting upstairs right now. You know, what is it that I tell them? What kind of jobs should they be doing? So it is a, it's a bit of a, a concern about um, their future and what their future will be. But then on the other hand, you know, um, your retirement is coming one day and then you're sitting here in Germany. Yeah, yes, I do want to live in this country and I want to be this a prosperous country. And how? can Germany be a prosperous country when there are predictions of several million less people in the workforce in a few years from now, but we still want 
all this taxes to be collected and the roads to be paved and all this kind of stuff. And so how's that going to happen? And this is why we have to talk, Bonnie, about this topic of, you know, what is it and how is it going to create jobs in those countries like the U.S., like Germany, like Japan as well? Thank you very much, Nils. I'm glad you brought up the idea of two sons, and I'm glad you brought up that very strange word called retirement. It's not in my vocabulary. I speak English, native English, but I, I somehow, when I look at my vocabulary list, retirement just isn't there, Nils, and I'm not planning on learning what that word means anytime <laughs> soon. We call retiring people We have off forced hours. retirement in, these kind, in Germany here. We, oh, my we goodness. Well, they wouldn't dare force me to do anything here in the U.S., so there you go. <laughs> Thank you very much much. Very interesting. If you're just tuning in, this is Technology Revolution, the future of now. And as I like to say, if somebody tells you the future is already here, they're wrong. That was yesterday's future. That was somebody else's idea of the future. We are here today making the future. We are starting to emerge globally from the global coronavirus, the novel coronavirus, COVID-19 pandemic. And the question of jobs is in a different light today, but we're still approaching this from the perspective of factory 4.0, industry 4.0. Where are we going in terms of what the world will need and who will manufacture it and supply it? And who will have those jobs? Will there be new titles we've never heard of? Will be we working alongside of and having lunch with a robot? What will we do with vacation time for a bot? Will we be able to see them? Will they just be coming over a loudspeaker or a headset? Who will we be? Where will our children and our grandchildren be working? Will it be exciting to have a job in a factory? And, and to my panelists, I'll tell you that, oh, about a year or two ago on one of my SAP Game Changers radio shows, the topic came up about what kinds of jobs will be in the factories. And this was way before we knew anything about a pandemic. And somebody said his son had a factory job where he was on the shop floor using an iPad. And he was getting real-time data to help involve him in what was happening in terms of production and efficiencies. And this young man was excited to have a factory job because he was part of the action. And the question came up, were people going to be proud and happy to have their kids working in a quote-unquote factory? And the answer was, if this trend continues, Heck yes. So that's what we're talking about today is where will these jobs be? What will they be called? What will they pay? Will we all have a 30-hour work week? Oh, my goodness, be still my heart. My very special panelists today are Gerd Hoppe, Dr. Christian Litka, Rakesh Gandhi, and Nils Hertzberg. They're all around the world, and I'm sitting here in Durham, North Carolina, looking at my panelists on Zoom, and it's delightful to see you all. So let's go to the part of the show now. Let's see. It's 1120. You know what? I have an advertiser who would like me to tell you about him right now, and then we'll go to our opening quotes. So I'd like to welcome our special sponsor, ExpressVPN. Uh, I don't know about you, but sometimes you're looking for stuff on the internet. You don't want anybody to know what you're looking for. Nils is smiling, I think. Uh, we know what we're talking about, Nils. Rakesh is looking at me like, seriously, Bonnie? Of course, people look for stuff. You might be looking for an old boy for an old girlfriend. You might be looking for somebody. They're scared. You might be looking for somebody or something that you don't really want other people to know about. So... Why do you think about what do you, what would you do? Some of you would go to incognito mode. It sounds so stealthy. Let me tell you something. Incognito mode does not hide your online activity. It doesn't matter what mode you use or how many times you clear your browsing history. Guess what? And my panelists, are, our heads are going up and down. Your internet service provider, your ISP, can still see every single website you have ever visited. That's why when I'm at home and a lot of people I know never go online without using, wait for it, ExpressVPN. It doesn't matter if you get your internet from Verizon, Spectrum, Comcast, ISPs in the U.S. can legally, uh-oh, sell your information to advertising companies. ExpressVPN is an app that reroutes your internet connection through their secure servers so your ISP cannot see the sites you visit. What a revolutionary idea. ExpressVPN also keeps all of your information secure. How? By encrypting 100% of your data with the most powerful encryption available. Most of the time, I don't even realize I have ExpressVPN on. It runs seamlessly in the background. It's easy to use. You tap one button and you are protected. ExpressVPN is available on all of your devices, your phones, your computers, 
even your smart TV, that's a wow. So there's no excuse not to use it. Here's the call to action. Everybody listen up. Protect your online activity today, right now, with the VPN that's rated number one by CNET and Wired. Visit my exclusive link, and I'll spell it out for you because I love to spell URLs, expressvpn.com slash techrev, and you get three extra months free on a one-year package. So it's E X P R E. S S V is in Victor P is in Paul and is in Nancy expressvpn.com slash. And I'll spell the special code for you. Tech rev T E C H R E V. That's code for the show technology revolution expressvpn.com slash tech rev to learn more. Thank you very much expressvpn for being with us for so many weeks as a sponsor. And now back to the show. So here we go. It's time for the quotes. Let's do this really, really fast, gentlemen. So I'm going to read the source of your quote very quickly. I'll read the quote. And why don't you each take about, oh, I'd say 90 seconds to tell us what your quote means to our topic. And then we'll have time to go through our predictions. So Gerd Hoppe sent me a quote from Madagascar. This is from Skipper to Private. Madagascar 2005, American computer animated comedy film produced by DreamWorks Animation. And it had an ensemble cast, a lot of famous people. And uh, these were two of the penguins in the movie. Here's the quote from Skipper to Private. I don't want problems. I want solutions. Gerd, what does this all mean to us? Yeah, I don't want problems. I want an unmute solution. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for sure. So, first of all, it's a great movie. movie. Uh, then I was just thinking about somebody who is in absolute positive mode and moves forward while... So the rest of the team is articulating problems. And so I think that uh, this question about future jobs is uh, can be tackled in a positive way or in a, in a negative way. And, and so what we want is we want to use digitalization and all the tools we have to provide solutions. So when uh, in former times, maybe 40,000 years back, people wanted uh, warmth. They, they wanted uh, um, a warm food and they wanted to stay warm at night. They invented the fire and moved forward with that. And then, of course, there might have been some um, people addressing the problems of fires, like burning down um, the environment. But but still, mankind carried forward with that. And uh, so, to the big picture, I think we have to uh, form, we have to uh, actually um, address the issues and form them in a way we want rather than letting this happen. This digitalization is not something that is coming over us like like COVID. COVID is something that we can't really uh, control very, very well, but digitalization or the way of manufacturing in the future is a choice to make. And so uh, this is what, um, uh, what Skipper does here. Uh, he wants the solution to a problem rather than somebody complaining to him that, th that things don't work. And of course, it's in a funny situation. They try to take over this tanker to go to the, the Antarctica. And um, so um, just on a side note to that. Thank you very much. I will tell everybody that Skipper thinks of private as naive and vulnerable and very inexperienced, but private is often the penguin in the pack who solves the problems. There we go. Okay. So. So much for being the young, the young little one who gets to solve problems. Let's move around the table to Dr. Christian Lika. And Christian has sent us a quote from Henry Ford. Christian, I have breaking news for you. Don't be mad at me. But Henry Ford apparently never said this. But somebody said he could have said it. And I have never looked into the source of this quote to see if it really was Henry Ford. So let me just give the attribution first. Uh, this is very interesting, Christian. And then I'll give the quote. And we love the quote, by the way. It, it's perfect. So a variation of the expression I'm going to read in a minute was connected to Ford in a 1999 cruise industry publication. Christian, so much we know about what's going on with cruises or not today. The author did not credit Ford directly, but he said, this is a cruise ship designer. He said, there is a problem trying to figure out what people want by canvassing them. And then he said, I mean, if Henry Ford canvassed people on whether or not he should build a motor car, they'd probably tell him what they really wanted was a faster horse. The attribution was credited directly to Ford years later, even after his death. So here's the quote. We still love it, Christian. If I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. So there you go. Now you know the full circle. Christian, let's just go with the quote. Um, attributed to Henry Ford popularly. We'll leave it at that. So how does this have to do with our topic today, Christian? Well, yes, we should do that because to an operations guy, Henry Ford is like a godfather. So 
uh, <laughs> we credit it to him. Well, uh, honestly, concerning uh, the, the, the future, I would always say the sky is not the limit. I mean, we are looking for outer space and things like that. And um, you, you have to imagine the unimaginable. And great, throughout history, great in, uh, inventions have always come from people who actually leave our uh, standardized subsequent steps who just go beyond it and, and go for something something up in the sky and, and reach for the limits. And, and that's what we need to do to uh, create our future. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Yes, we will say Henry Ford. We're just going to go with it. I didn't know there was a whole debate on quote investigator about this, but I thought it was really cool that it came from a cruise designer. <laughs> okay, let's go to Rakesh Gandhi. Rakesh has sent us a quote. We've never seen this quote exactly this way before. It's from Deepak Chopra in his novel, The Return of Merlin. Deepak Chopra, very much alive and well. Uh, Rakesh, I get to call Deepak Chopra a young man because he was born in 1946. So let's just leave that one alone. He's an Indian-born American author and alternative medicine advocate, prominent in the New Age movement. His books and videos have made him one of the best known and wealthiest people in alternative medicine. And he's the author of many books. The Return of Merlin is called A Brilliantly Realized Narrative That Begins in Arthurian Times and Jumps Boldly to Our Own 20th Century. Well, we're in the 21st century. De dark age of war, pollution, predation, and hatred with a message of hope. So here is the quote. There are no accidents. There is only some purpose that we haven't yet understood. So, Rakesh, talk to me. How'd you find this one? <laughs> oh, well, I mean, uh, I'm like I said in my bio intro as well, I'm a firm believer that... Uh, Innovation is something that comes out of innate desires, right? A lot of times mm -hmm. we believe that uh, innovation is an accident, right? Uh, to your point, uh, the fast carriage or fast horses versus the car, right? I mean, Henry Ford did not uh, invent the car out of accident. Uh, it, it came out of the innate desires, so to say. So in that regard, I believe that, you know, None of this is an accident. I mean, whatever innovation that we're doing, the digital journeys that we are kind of taking in different areas, especially in smart factories, uh, they come from some purpose uh, that we may not have understood at the time when the technology was getting evolved. Uh, but as uh, things getting uh, getting involved, we see that, you know, uh, we are able to kind of get to a path of digitization. Earlier, you give an example of... Uh, a kid who is now enthused, enthused to work in manufacturing because he has an he can work on an iPad and everything is digital. iPad invention itself was was really not an accident. Um, the touch screen wasn't an accident. Uh, it, it came from the innate desire that hey, how do we simplify our user experience, right? So this directly relates uh, relates to all the things that we do around the digital transformation innovation leveraging technologies around you know improving our lives um, and the topics of smart manufacturing industry for auto and so on as well that's my two cents thank you rakesh i appreciate that it's a very well put quote for our topic today thank you so much nils hertzberg waiting patiently nils last time i said that to somebody they said to me how do you know i'm waiting patiently so i'm just going to pretend you are because i'm looking at you on zoom and you look so relaxed and patient so here we go nils has sent us a quote from nelson mandela nelson rolilala mandela eight 1918 to 2013, South African anti-apartheid revolutionary political leader and philanthropist who served as president of South Africa from 1994 to 1999. And here is the quote, beautiful quote, a winner is a dreamer who never gives up. Oh, I like that. Nils, talk to me. How'd you pick that for today's show? Um, I picked it for today's show. I've been for multiple, I mean, you know me on the show. I always pick, um, um, Quotes from Nelson Mandela, uh, it's tradition, uh, mm -hmm. because he's the president of my, my country. Well, he was the president of my country. That's where I come from. And um, I think um, you, know, you have to be able to imagine things. You have to be able to dream things um, in order to actually get something um, done. I'll give you um, an example. You're another fellow South African, um, Elon Musk. Um, you know, he's launching actually... Um, uh, rockets today. NASA is going to fly uh, to the International Space Station today on a private um, transport. Mm -hmm. Who imagined that three years ago or uh, ten years ago? Um, that is, you know, that guy has a dream, 
and um, you know, he's changing the world. Now suddenly you can be a startup and build satellites. That is the kind of stuff um, that uh, you have to do. But this is also in manufacturing. If you, um, you, if you actually stop dreaming, if you stop imagining and you let the, the, the yes, but crowd take over, you're never going to get there. So that is why I actually chose this um, quote. Thank you very much. Interesting. If we relate that back to the quote about there being no accidents and we relate that back to, uh, you mentioned Elon Musk. I'm thinking the first day I launched Coffee Break with Game Changers for SAP Radio was October 5th, 2011. And that was the day Steve Jobs passed away. And that wa- that's why it's always seared in my brain the day I started the radio show and, and Talk about somebody who said, you may not know, well, I'm paraphrasing loosely, very loosely, of course, poetic license, if you will, Garrett is smiling. Uh, uh, that, that's why we think, how did he know that he knew what we wanted and needed before we even knew that we wanted and needed it? That was one of his, his fraying, phrases, give people what they want before they even know they want it. So an interesting concept. Thank you all. Great quotes. Now it's time for predictions. Let's make this pretty much a lightning round. I'm going to start with Garrett Hoppe, and I'm going to read your first prediction. Garrett, I'll read it because it's short, and I'd like you to take no more than about 90 seconds to tell us a little more about what it means. Then I'll pick one from Christian. I'll pick one from Rakesh, one from Nils. And let's see how many predictions we can give to our listeners so that they have an idea of where the four of you think jobs are going in the, what we call factory of the future, industry 4.0. And I know there's even some talk of already a, a factory 5.0, industry 5.0. So let's go. Garrett Hoppe told me the following before the show. His prediction number one, future factory jobs will still cover manual labor. Humans are hard to replace as they are extremely flexible. Go ahead and finish the rest of that, Garrett. Talk to me. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, it's true. Uh, if we look at how hard it is to automate things, and in this automated e- equipment and environment in manufacturing floors, consider and cover all the difficulties of variations in raw materials and unpredictable situations, then humans are the most flexible workforce we can think of. And so I personally don't believe that they are being replaced uh, in total. What I do think is that we are in a situation in which uh, consumers are always confronted with even more perfect products. And so the fact that there is inhumane labor and people have to repeat at very high precision and in, in covered with uh, protective clothes and, and avoiding any human footprint or fingerprint on a product you know, to provide for a perfect product that is inhumane, it is driven by consumer demand. If, if you today, I said this before, if you would be presented a product that could, that would um, present a mark of a human touch, you would refuse it as pre-used, pre-owned, and not accept it as new and buy it, actually. So um, it's, uh, we have to, if we think about human labor, it's not the bad people around the world, so I'm not addressing specific areas. Uh, it's, it's the consumer who wants the $5 T-shirt, um, and, and that covers for the Pakistanis who have to produce um, um, at an hourly wage of less uh, than 50 cents. And, and, and so we have to come to this idea. If we are staying with the first prediction, um, the, the future allows us uh, with automation, with robots, with all the good tools of uh, technology, artificial intelligence, and uh, other things to guide workers. And that opens a door to people that we have eliminated from the work floor since quite a while to ever higher skilled workers. So the programmer was coming in, the expert was coming in, um, several years of education on the job, um, clean room workers, um, engineers, all of this is going to be complemented by people who are uh, instructed by guidance systems, which are highly intelligent. And uh, these kind of combinations allow again for a workforce that provides wealth to many instead of just sorting the lower level edu- of education out of the workforce, which is an inhumane thing in itself. But we have to work on that. We have to want it. By just uh, waiting for it, this will not happen. Um, 
Thank you very much, Garrett Hoppe. Let's go to Dr. Christian Licka. Number one prediction from you, Christian, is a nice uh, segue, actually, from what Garrett was just saying. You predict, while we will see more automation, we will also learn to appreciate craftsmanship. What a thought. Christian, tell me more, please. Well, uh, I have to give credit to, to, to Gert. He, he already stole like half of my, my thoughts, but um, <laughs> he, he's right. I mean, humans are very flexible and uh, they have a set of unique skills and, and people are willing to pay for that. I mean, uh, we, we, we adore uh, tailor-made shoes uh, or suits or something like this, or uh, people pay more than 100,000 euros or so for, for a Swiss-made watch uh, made by, by a Swiss man uh, by, by hand. So. Uh, we even go for that in the mass uh, product uh, range. I mean, uh, when I throw away a pair of jeans because they are worn, uh, my, 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 my daughters would pick them out of the trash and would say, hey, that's a designer piece. Um, so uh, there, there will be room for craftsmanship. There will be room for handmade uh, stuff. Although, of course, automation is going to increase and this is going to change the, the workforce, of course. Interesting, Christian. What about the make for me where factories are supposed to be able to be able to pivot going from mass production to I'll make that one pair of very unique thousand dollar sneakers somebody ordered online. I'll deliver them within 24 hours. They will have diamonds on the toe. They will have rubies on the heel. And then I'll be able to go back to producing 200,000 of the regular white sneaks. Uh, is Are we considering that craftsmanship because somebody has to put together perhaps the 3D printing design for those custom sneakers? Quickly, Christian, what do you think? Is that can we call that craftsmanship, or are we you talking more at the human hands-on level? I, I would really say human hands-on level. Of course, you can put a high price tag to everything, uh, but uh, you, you can see the real difference. If, if I mean, take uh, take art. If, if someone is a really good painter, you will see the difference to to an, to a good copy or something like this. Thank you very much. Appreciate your indulging my question. It just dawned on me. Rakesh sent me a very long prediction number one here. Rakesh, I'm going to read a little bit from the first part of it and a little bit from the message part of it and ask you to tell us more. You say re-insourcing of manufacturing capacities and supply chain closer to served markets with modular smart factories will be a new consideration against low cost locations. Now let me add the part I want you to talk about. You say this will drive more jobs and opportunities for individual entrepreneurs in local markets. Rakesh, bring out this, uh, extend this prediction for me, please. I love it. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I mean, trends always keeps on changing, right? I mean, smart factory can be considered in, in, in different, um, ways i mean people are doing the smart factories today with the with one large factories located somewhere in the world and then they try to put the supply chain and then serve different markets um, and especially with the changing world around us will drive some of these trends to change as well and uh, especially things like covid and even before that this was being thought about as to how best to serve the consumer in that particular market unit where you're serving that customer from, right? And uh, the trends of COVID and um, this will only accelerate this trend in terms of uh, what would companies be thinking of instead of having one mass production facility and then using the complex supply chain to supply around the world uh, versus building the small units uh, and then trying to replicate in different market units. Now, this would also spread the jobs but create the jobs near that market unit, right? I, I think that that's key. In addition to that, it will grow the supplier network as well for that particular manufacturing unit of any company. So this will only create more jobs in, in, in different uh, areas based on where they are serving the customer directly. And like you said, uh, also with the ability of 3D printing and so on, you'll see a lot of entrepreneurship kick in as well who becomes a supplier to this uh, small satellite production facilities. Um, I think that's a prediction I'm kind of taking from this uh, term of reinsourcing of manufacturing capacities uh, coming closer to the market where you're serving. Thank you very much, Rakesh. Appreciate that. Nils, you sent me a second version of your predictions, and I'm looking at number three because I like that one. You say the evolution of jobs in the call center industry is a good prediction for the evolution of jobs in manufacturing. You have to connect the dots for me, Nils. I have no idea. So talk to us. 
Yeah, it's actually, um, you know, if you look at the uh, call center industry, you know, the phones, uh, if you look, go back 20 years, you know, if you would call a company, um, somebody local would answer the phone. Um, then what happened was that um, your technology evolved, uh, but not fast enough. So uh, you, you actually were connected to a call center in Manila where people had been trained to speak American accent English, and they would start working on your problems. But um, then what happened at the next step is, and um, these you call today, um, you have a chat bot that is trying to actually answer your phone. Um, you have a, a pre-selection menu that is trying to help you through and figure out what your problem is yourself. And you know, just the other day, I had a problem and um, you know, called one of these famous companies. And uh, yes, I did actually speak to a person and I asked her where this person is. This person was actually working from their home office in Bavaria uh, using an Irish phone number. Um, so um, the job had come full circle and it's back in a high cost country. Um, but it has actually seen such a lot of automation and smartness that companies can't afford to bring these jobs back um, to in building on Rakesh's comment they can bring these jobs back. I think the same has hap is going to happen with manufacturing. You know, a lot of the manufacturing has gone where it is gone because of our inability to automate these jobs fast enough, the factories fast enough. And um, I, I firmly believe, that, and also you know, the crisis that we're in at this very moment, and the, the need to near source building again on Rakesh's comment, the need to near source will drive automation. However, automation in high cost countries, um, they do it because the worker costs 40 euros or $40 or $50 an hour. If you to ask Christian just now, you know, what does his robot that actually moves boxes from left to right? I think that thing costs about $50 a day. And um, so that is the way you are going to make this stuff affordable in high cost country. And that's the way how manufacturing will come back to, uh, to the US, to Europe, to Japan. Thank you very much. Great first round of predictions. Let's see how many we can squeeze into the time we have left. Garrett Hoppe, I'm looking at prediction number three. I like this one. I mentioned it in my opening. You say work in the future will mean less hours to work, reducing work hours from 60 down to 48, down to 40, down to 37.5 is not so far back. When do we take the next step? I can only say, Garrett, if only. You got to unmute, Garrett, before you talk. Yeah, the of course, we should consider the, the new technology not only good for gains of entrepreneurs, so um, Amazon, the big winner, but in all fairness to um, population involved, for workforce involved, uh, the trick does its best when we have everyone participate in the gains of future production. So as we talk about flexibility, um, and as we talk about short supply chains, um, basically Rakesh provides input to a situation that we love in, to have in Germany and, and uh, in Europe. And um, so that um, shines a little bit on our fourth prediction, which uh, we might be coming to at a later time. But I still believe that if we have uh, the benefit of future labor provided for all, then what we have to do is we have to provide benefit to everyone in spreading the gains to the entire workforce involved, not just to the owner of the company, uh, to the shareholder of the company, and to the CEO driving a bigger car or getting a higher pay paycheck. And that's the reason why I truly believe that as we see um, hard uh, manual labor go away, uh, the sweatshop uh, jobs go away, the high precision fatiguing job go away. This will all happen. People will come back to having a more enjoyable, more relaxing and more entertaining work day. And one element of that is working less hours. Staying more at home, we can see this with COVID right now. There have been so many predictions that uh, working from home would uh, cut down efficiency at work and, and people have been held in um, office silos in, in, in the big uh, metros and hubs uh, along the uh, highways 
with a lot of commute to get there and an endless carbon footprint to be produced just to get to the place and get away from that. And now we're working from home. And funny enough, we are high in efficiency and it's, it's going better than ever. And, and the fun part is that our internet is not overloaded with that because the overload to the internet comes in the evening hours when everyone is streaming. So during the day, our internet lines are just idling along while we work. <laughs> and, and that's why we're doing this on, on Zoom today. Thank you very much. I have to read you all a quote, a famous quote. And, and Christian, you're up next, and I'm going to be looking at prediction number three from you, Christian. Quote from Warren Bennis. I should have opened the show with this. The factory of the future will have only two employees, a man and a dog. The man will be there to feed the dog. The dog will be there to keep the man from touching the equipment. Very famous <laughs> quote. <laughs> I think Garrett hasn't heard that one before. Nils, if you did, you're politely laughing. And Rakesh, I think it's new to you. Christian, I can't see your camera. So very interesting. Christian, let's talk about prediction number three. Concerning the worker environment, health and safety, we will see for in first to fourth world factories. This is going to be the new order of business, isn't it, Christian? Tell me a little bit more. A brief prediction, please. Yeah, what, what I see upcoming is, um, like, like uh, Gert said, we are going to bring back a lot of production, aut highly automized production to, to first world countries. And uh, we are going to work on a high level of, of safety and, and environment and all these kind of things. Um, but uh, we will still have the, the low paid jobs uh, for uh, parts uh, that we need for chemicals and, and things like that. And this will take place in, in other parts of the world. And there people are not getting much richer, um, we are going to, to, to use their work workforce at a very low wage. And um, so we, we will have the separation. And uh, now for, uh, for the big countries like US, Germany, Japan or so, uh, I think we are all in the first world, but uh, there are some who are at the verge and, and uh, for them it's going to be hard to decide whether they're going to be second, third or even first world uh, countries uh, with respective in environments. Thank you very much. Uh, Rakesh, I'm on prediction number four because this was very provocative, the one you sent me. I'm just going to read the first sentence and ask you to run with it for about two minutes. You say, every home will be a new smart factory. Wow. What are we talking about, Rakesh? Yeah, uh, this is where I was alluding earlier as well. Um, as all these trends happen, I mean, this is uh, all full circle coming together, right? We will see a lot of things that are get, like, getting manufactured in, in a big plant like environment, uh, not everywhere, but uh, in, in a lot of areas can be done by entrepreneurs, can be done when I say home in the sense um, from, from the local uh, one man shop, so to say. Um, and and uh, here the technologies like 3D printing will continue to become prevalent and cheaper. Think about uh, your you know, printers that you use at home now or copier that you use at your home now. What was it, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, you had to go to a shop to get a photocopy, right? Uh, and it, it got famous as, you know, I want to do a Xerox, for example, <laughs> to do a photocopy. But now it, it's at home. So think about it this way, right? I mean, 3D, you have a 3D printer at home. And that day is not very far. And then you can produce a lot of this uh, small, small items. And uh, maybe it's a business that you run out of it. So that, that's where I'm coming from this, you know, this evolution of the technology. The job opportunities that it may create is not just in the plant as we know today. That plant could be your home smart plant with 3D printing and something more. That is where I'm taking this prediction towards. Very interesting. Thank you. I know the price of 3D printers has come down. I don't know about the size and the weight of them, but I'm going to give you a point of reference in history, gentlemen. In 1988, I wanted to be a graphic designer, and I couldn't afford the cost of the basic equipment. And my parents gave me a business loan to put one uh, it's a it's a computer that has a picture of a fruit on it. We all know who it is. I've mentioned the founder before. One of those on my desk and a black and white printer cost eleven thousand five hundred U.S. dollars in 1988. Eleven thousand five hundred dollars. That was so. I was printing, but wow! I remember the days when my little HP printer, when I was living in New York, cost me 125 bucks to buy a cartridge at Staples, and I was lucky if they even had it. For goodness sake. So we have seen now it's on demand. I get a 
they, they know how much ink I have. They mail me a little a little tiny cartridge every couple of months. I pay five bucks a month. And 3D printing, I would love to have a 3D printer here. I would probably do what some Harvard, uh, I think she was a graduate student a couple of years ago, tried to print lipstick. I love my red lipstick, and sometimes they don't have my color. I'd print my own lipstick here. I don't know what it would feel like, but anyway, now with Zoom, we have to be careful. Let's go to Nils. We have time for a prediction for you, and then we're going to wrap up. Nils says, number six, This I don't know if this is good or bad, Nils. You say the need for manual labor will decline. The need for highly skilled labor will increase. So, Nils, can we spin this in a positive way that people will have time to upskill, reskill, retrain, not just the graduates coming out of trade schools and colleges and high schools, but people are in the workforce us now you see that these manual labor jobs will will they go away is it doom and gloom i hate to ask but i have to nils two minutes please no it isn't doom and gloom i think um you know, there is an obligation or need for everybody who works um to continue to learn about um you know, the environment and um you know, the manufacturing job um you know is um, evolving over time you know, it used to be a machine operator who operated the machine, then it's a machine programmer who programmed the machine. Now um, you're, you're programming the factory and there are some folks in um, in the factory who just make sure that everything is going right. So, and um, I think the, the, the skills that are required are, are changing over time. Um, and um, uh, yes, there may be some folks who will not make it, but I think the majority will actually evolve over time and um, you know, and um, they will be um, in these factories for a very long time, but they just need to learn um, as they go forward. Bonnie, just to, to remind you, you, you started this about um, you know, the guy who was talking to you about being excited that their son was going to mm -hmm. do a factory job. Yep. That is exactly it. Um, yep. It's these kind of jobs that will um, evolve and that will produce those immaculate products that get spoke about those who do not which do not have a fingerprint on them and that they look as new and they're very very precise that is manufacturing of the future and um you know they may actually build um you know, at that specific phone that bonnie wants variant configuration that's what the manufacturing of the future is going to be all about and um that um, will require folks to, to, to learn, to grow, to evolve their skills. But, um, um, and it's going to be less manual labor, I believe, but it's going to be more about programming the processes. But coming back to Christian's comment about artisans, you know, I've seen people program his robots to play music. That, for me, is the artisan of the future. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate that, Nils. That's a great upbeat way of, of looking at this. I want to do a quick call to action again for our sponsor today. Protect your online activity today with the VPN rated number one by CNET and Wired. Visit my exclusive link, and it is exclusive, expressvpn.com slash techrev, and you can get an extra three months free on a one-year package. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V pn.com slash t-e-c-h-r-e-v expressvpn.com slash techrev to learn more. I have to do a big shout out to my four panelists from all over the world. It's been lovely. Christian, we missed you on camera here, but it's been lovely watching Rakesh and Gerd and Nils think out loud while I'm hearing them. I'm watching their facial expressions and if they're leaning back in their chairs and what their, their rooms look like. And this was actually a lot of fun. So appreciation to my panelists, Gerd Hoppe at Beckoff automation to Dr. Christian Litka at Kuka AG at Rakesh Gandhi at SAP and Nils Hertzberg at SAP. And of course, a shout out to Ryan Treasure, the voice of my opening co-producer and VP at World Talk Radio Voice America and Aaron Keller, my engineer extraordinaire, who's always there for me. So I'm just going to say to everybody, my usual closing, first of all, be safe, be smart, be well, be careful how you reopen wherever you are in the world. Take care of yourself. We're each responsible for ourselves and for everybody else but ourselves first. So think about that. And now I'm going to say thank you for tuning in to Technology Revolution, the future of now. Remember the future of now? It didn't happen yet. Why? Well, that was yesterday's future. We're all here making it happen right now. I'm looking at these wonderful smiling faces. So thank you very much. You're an important part of it. Let's make it the best future ever. Bonnie D. Graham signing off. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us for Technology Revolution, the future of now. 
Mark your calendar to join host Bonnie D. Graham every Wednesday at 8 a.m. Pacific Time, 11 a.m. Eastern on the Voice America Business Channel to hear how technology is impacting your future now. Bye.